What did she say on Saturday afternoon? We had guests, Jenny and Trev, our longtime friends since moving to Houston. They always took part in our social events, dinners, gatherings with neighbors, or gatherings after a movie at each other's house. In our early 30s, we were all college graduates struggling with the burden of student loans, pursuing careers, and being separated from time to time due to business trips by Trev and my wife, Debbie. Debbie was just getting ready for one of these trips. Trev had recently left our home for the West Coast where his duties lay. It became our way of life. While he was traveling, we stayed at home doing household chores. Jenny continued her career as an accountant, and I worked as an architect. Our own travels were few, unlike Trev's frequent trips. As a rule, only one spouse ventured on such trips. In such cases, the second spouse often visited the couple who stayed in the city, sharing a pleasant evening dinner or a leisurely weekend picnic with them. After saying goodbye to Trev, we watched him leave in a taxi heading to the airport while the girls were chatting in the kitchen. I decided to go to the garage. The first thing I did was clean up my workbench, making sure everything was in its place. Then I turned my attention to the security system in which we had invested a decent amount of money, especially in connection with the recent robberies in our area. Our security system included microphones and cameras strategically located in each room, and they all transmitted recordings to a server located in the attic through our cloud account. All captured data was saved when motion sensors were triggered on any of the devices. It was incredibly convenient. I could easily monitor any room through the app on my phone or on any computer I had access to. Out of habit, I decided to check if the system was working correctly. How was your recent business trip? Jenny asked, turning to my wife, Debbie, when they were both sitting at the kitchen table. Debbie giggled a little and replied, the usual routine, work, dinner, going to the bar, and eventually some sleep. You know, a typical business trip program. Jenny, worried about her husband's actions during such trips, asked, is it right to talk about people who break away from their family while on a business trip? Debbie was silent for a moment, considering her answer. After a meaningful pause, she calmed Jenny down by taking a sip of her drink. Don't worry too much, Jen. I wouldn't attach too much importance to it. Trev comes back to you all the time, doesn't he? Yes, but I can't stop thinking about what he's doing alone, if, of course, he has it. Don't pay attention to what happens in his absence, Debbie said firmly. What do you mean, Deb? Jenny asked. Exactly what I said, my wife replied. Everything that happens outside the house doesn't matter at all. I was discouraged when my wife's words echoed in my mind, everything that happens outside our house doesn't matter at all. And what is really going on? The absence of people in their homes makes no difference? The actions and events that occur when people are absent from their homes have no meaning? I wondered inwardly if she had actually said those words. Jenny, overcome with anxiety, demanded, Debbie, what are you implying? But Debbie had become more calm and collected by this point. She replied cautiously, Nothing, Jen. I just wanted to say that your fears are groundless. Trev adores you endlessly. He's coming home to you, and he loves you. His travels are exclusively of a business nature. Jenny was clearly worried, as she did not find comfort in Debbie's remark, but she gracefully allowed my wife to turn the conversation in another direction. After giving them a chance to chat, I retired to the kitchen and poured myself a cup of coffee, hoping to clear my mind of what I had just heard. The small talk continued for another 40 minutes before Jenny said goodbye and went home, and we settled in for the night. Although I remained polite to my wife, I was overcome by a sense of weariness. To describe the effect of her words as just making me nervous would be an understatement. As she went upstairs to freshen up, my head was full of thoughts. Did she betray me during her absence? Was it a repetitive act that happened several times, or maybe it's just a single case, recent or distant? But the way she said her words revealed more than she had imagined. It wasn't contemplative introspection, there was no hint of concern or disapproval in her tone. On the contrary, it was a direct recognition, an acceptance of reality without any condemnation. What should I do now? What actions should a man take? Can I have a short talk with her? Would I risk breaking up a four-year marriage? We had plans to start a family. Did she engage in intimacy during the trip? How can I be sure that the child will be mine? 
Then it occurred to me that she often traveled to Phoenix, San Diego, Seattle, and Omaha. Did she have multiple lovers in each of these places, or just one? Was he more attractive, bigger, or richer? None of these thoughts awakened me, on the contrary, they left me feeling disappointed. I was overcome with anxiety and deep sadness. The only person I cared deeply about, the woman I loved, betrayed me by committing infidelity. Despite desperately hoping that all this was a misunderstanding, my rational mind inexorably forced me to admit the painful truth. It was my wife, Debbie, who hinted to a friend about her cheating. I couldn't bring myself to go to bed with her that night. Instead, I pretended to be fast asleep on the couch, burying my face in the pillows. Although she tried to wake me up, I pretended to be deep asleep, and eventually, she gave up. Avoiding eye contact, I decided not to turn to her because my heart couldn't bear to meet her at that moment. I stayed in this position all night, unable to find restful sleep until dawn when consciousness began to return to normal. The alluring aroma of freshly brewed coffee reached me, accompanied by the sound of footsteps and the soft clatter of sandals in the neighboring kitchen. Slowly opening one eye, I saw that there was a steaming cup of coffee in front of me, beckoning me with its attention. Despite my fears, I remained motionless, not saying a word and not moving from my place. But deep down, I knew that I could no longer dodge the inevitable. Having plucked up the courage, I finally opened both eyes and saw that Debbie was standing by the sofa, dressed in sandals and a bathrobe. When she looked at me, her blonde hair cascaded over her right shoulder. Ignoring the coffee, I quickly got up from my seat and walked past her, catching the concern in her eyes. I ignored it and locked myself in the bathroom. When I started brushing my teeth, a creaking outside told me that she was somewhere nearby, but eventually, everything fell silent. Not a single word has passed between us all morning, but this silence was a relief to me because I wasn't ready to start a conversation yet. It was not fear that held me down, but on the contrary, I was looking forward to this meeting. But before I could get down to business, I needed indisputable confirmation. I had an insatiable need for information, it was embedded in my essence. Before taking any action, I always had a clear picture of the situation. With a determined attitude, I took my trusty laptop and settled into a cozy office nestled in the corner of our living room. Sitting at a table overlooking the living room, I took a strategically advantageous position so that the screen was protected from prying eyes, especially from Debbie's eyes. Making her way from the bedroom to the kitchen, she deliberately kept her distance from me, seemingly oblivious to my presence. The deafening silence that enveloped the room only increased my disappointment. Why didn't she ask me what was bothering me? Maybe it's some kind of complicated game she's playing. Taking a deep breath, I forced myself to regain my composure and let go of the anger growing in me. My attention was focused solely on finding private detectives in the city where she went. Taking the necessary steps, I diligently filled out the questionnaires and described the tasks in detail. Subsequently, I resorted to using my personal credit card to order the services of four detective agencies to conduct an investigation. Later in the afternoon, she finally asked if I was hungry, but I refused her offer, pretending to be busy to avoid having dinner together. Not wanting to engage in conversation with her, I continued to watch her intently, ignoring her puzzled look from the kitchen. I had no desire to answer her curiosity. A wife who has no secrets would naturally wonder why her husband has become estranged from her, a wife with a clear conscience. On a sudden impulse, I offered to leave and quickly got up, taking my wallet, mobile phone, and car keys. She seemed taken aback for a moment but soon nodded and reached for her purse. She already had a mobile phone in her hand, the one she was constantly clinging to. Debbie never let her phone out of her sight, and it was password protected. As we headed for the exit, I stepped aside and watched a charming and youthful silhouette float by, a silhouette that until the previous evening, I had considered my own reflection. We usually used my car for walks, so she gracefully settled into the passenger seat, waiting for me to open the door as usual. Given the recent turn of events, this was the last thing I wanted, but I forced myself to make this gesture anyway. Whatever happened before she left on Tuesday, I had to make sure she didn't have any suspicions. The fear that I had already made a mistake weighed heavily on me. I'm sorry about today, I confessed. I think I made a mistake in the design work, and I will need to fix the situation quickly and make corrections when I come on Monday. She breathed a sigh of relief, 
but then her expression turned worried. The Johnson Projects, what is it? She asked, referring to the house I finished three weeks ago. She didn't seem to pay much attention to our conversations. No, I replied, it's related to a future project. This week, I will create new drawings and correct my mistake. I reassured myself that everything would be fine, although I really did not like to make mistakes. You're being too hard on yourself, she replied in a calmer tone. When I gave the expected explanation, mistakes happen to everyone, I almost said those exact words, but I restrained myself. We had a light conversation, delving into trivia and discussing bills. At this time, my thoughts were busy with how to decide where to sleep better. I knew I couldn't avoid the consequences of falling asleep on the couch again. When I got home, I took a refreshing shower and then went to bed, armed with a tablet to read a little. But it seems I was stuck on the same page for half an hour until Debbie finished taking a shower and came out of the bathroom wearing a bathrobe. I realized that whenever she wore this robe, it meant her intention to engage in intimacy. Succumbing to the temptation of the moment, we engaged in passionate lovemaking, awakening memories of the last time we shared such a bond. While she was lying next to me wrapped in a bathrobe, I pretended to be engrossed in a book, although her touch on my thigh drew me closer. Eventually, she asked if something was bothering me, seeking confirmation of our relationship. Eventually, she said it, and I answered, turning my attention to her expression. I longed for any hint she might offer me. When I found her pills in the bathroom, I realized that you were taking them again, I stated. At my statement, she froze in place with a feeling of remorse. She confessed, yes, I know. I sincerely apologize for that. I thought we'd put it off for a few more months. I nodded, deciding not to make a fuss. No problem, I replied, you are completely unreasonable. However, there was no concern in my words, rather a simple statement of irritation. No, I replied, agreeing that I didn't want a child at the moment either. Although I didn't put it into words, I silently considered this decision. There was a short pause, then she took her hand away, and I remained motionless. After a few moments, she turned away from me and turned off the light in her part of the room. I could feel her breathing, and eventually, she began to cry softly. It was an unbearable situation for me. I got up, clutching the tablet in my hands, and left the room. I heard her calling my name, but I closed the door and went back to the couch. When I woke up the next morning, she was already awake and ready to go to work in her work suit. It was six o'clock in the morning, my usual time for a morning run. I made you coffee, she told me, her voice breaking as if she wanted to say something else, but hesitated. When did you find out the truth about the pills? She asked. I was thinking about answering honestly, admitting that it was only yesterday, but I didn't want her to take it as a recent revelation. Last week, I lied, feeling the weight of my deception stop affecting me as I no longer cared about being dishonest with her. You didn't even tell me about it. You didn't even bother to get my opinion, I expressed my opinion. That's all I can say, I replied. No problem, Deb, I replied. If you don't want to have a child with me, then I don't want to either. She seemed to want to say something, but I quickly walked past her. I was late and had to hurry. I craved solitude to calm my mind. Running has always helped me to collect my thoughts and come to my senses. This journey began during high school, continued through the army, and finally college. Running has become my solace, freeing me from distraction and self-doubt as a young man and then as a married man who is now thinking about divorce. Evening was approaching, she returned home and cooked dinner. Out of politeness, I joined her at the table and ate, although I barely managed to finish my plate. Can we discuss the baby when I get back from my trip? She asked. If you want, I replied, trying to be polite. My thoughts were consumed by her words to Jenny, leaving no room for anything else. Morning came, and she waited patiently for me to wake up, ready to hit the road, dressed in a traveling suit. Her bag and coat lay neatly by the door. Worried about my well-being during her absence, she asked if I would be okay. With a sense of confidence, I assured her that I would manage, as always. Carson, she said, I love you. I nodded politely in appreciation. At that moment, the agony on my face did not escape her attention, just as her own pain was obvious to me. 
As she rushed out the door, I could have sworn I caught the faint sound of a sob escaping from her lips. Staying in place, I couldn't help but watch as the car's engine roared and gradually disappeared into the distance. That day, I went to consult a lawyer about the divorce process. Considering that our marriage was childless, we focused on the division of property acquired during our life together. But the presence of adultery complicated the situation when it came to the division of property. Looking back, I can say that the lack of a prenuptial agreement was an unfortunate omission on my part. But if the investigators had found any valuable evidence, they could have tipped the scales in my favor, allowing me to claim a significant portion of our common property. Unfortunately, the lawyers involved in this case seemed to be more interested in delaying the trial in order to get the maximum reward. This is an incredibly confusing situation. Jenny sent me texts and left messages, but I wasn't ready to talk yet. I was thinking of visiting her later, but before I could do that, she surprised me by showing up at the workplace. She was standing by my car and anxiously asked, Why aren't you answering my calls and texts? I replied, explaining that something was bothering me. Invite me to dinner and then let's go home, she demanded. We really need to have a serious conversation. A remark about the insignificance of staying away from home, which my wife once mentioned, came to mind. Jenny nodded in my direction, meeting my gaze. Where is she today? What is it? She asked. In San Diego, I replied, and added, at least that's what she claims. Then Jenny asked if I had called her at work, to which I replied shyly, no. She immediately remarked, maybe you should have, since I called. Feeling stupid, I stared back at her, looking for some kind of approval. The following Friday, Debbie returned from a trip and headed to the office before heading home. By that time, dinner was ready, and the table was set. Oh my god, honey, she exclaimed, impressed by my efforts. She rushed over to kiss me, although it wasn't passionate, it was the kind that spouses usually share, even in public. I responded to her caress with a quick kiss, without feeling any awkwardness. And yet, deep down, I couldn't help but wonder if that gentle kiss and her warm hand on my arm would be the last moments of our intimacy. Breaking the silence, I informed her, Herb and John are already on their way here for dinner. When I was checking the stuffed peppers in the oven, my surprise increased when she asked, Are they coming today, Trev? Understanding her predicament, I thought for a moment before she said, I think it's just you and me, interrupting me in mid-sentence. Deciding to pack up, I watched her head into the bedroom, putting on a business suit as she went, knowing that she attended a morning meeting in Omaha and then flew home, stopping by her office on the way. I couldn't help but admire her dedication, naturally, she intended to freshen up, have dinner, and relax. This is not surprising, considering that it has been a long and tedious week, right? I looked at my phone for the latest messages from Jen on the way. The letter arrived just five minutes ago. At the same time, the noise of the shower upstairs stopped. If everything goes according to plan, Deb will be ready as soon as possible, just in time for the arrival of the guests. They're on their way, I called to her, but there was no answer. I understood her reluctance, the sight of them was the least desirable thing she could imagine. She came down the stairs dressed in casual attire, jeans, and a white t-shirt. The faint outline of pink bra straps peeked out from under it. Like our favorite shoes during the holiday days, she was wearing flip-flops. Giving me a nervous smile, she came up to me and gently put her hand on my shoulder. How can I help you? What is it? She asked. I replied, looking at the stuffed peppers, I have wine cooling in the fridge. They will be ready in just 15 minutes. It has a wonderful fragrance, she commented, glancing at the pot. Curiosity was aroused in her, and she asked, What is that delicious aroma coming from the pot? Smiling tenderly, I replied, This is orzo pasta. At the same time, a note of sadness clouded her expression as she silently acknowledged my choice for tonight's dinner. It was the very dish that I had lovingly prepared for her on our last anniversary, a cherished memory of our charming trip to Europe where we discovered the delights of Greek cuisine during our honeymoon. The memories that came flooding back weighed on my heart, but this evening had to take place, and this dish was an integral part of it. When I was carefully setting the table for four, two on each side, her gaze lingered on it for a short while. I took a bottle of Zinfandel out of the refrigerator, uncorked it, and took a deep breath. May I ask what is it? 
she asked, just as the doorbell rang. I'll take care of everything, I assured her, leaving her in the kitchen. I whispered under my breath, showtime. Our friends were standing outside the door, and they looked a little worried. She greeted me with a knowing smile and kissed me on the lips in front of their eyes. Hello, stud, she said playfully, pulling away and walking past me. It was obvious that Trevor wasn't surprised by our open affection. Hi, Trev, I greeted him, flashing a smile. I deliberately avoided a smirk. Come in, Carson, I responded with a simple confession. For the first time in a long while, I really paid attention to Trevor, noticing his curious glances moving between Jenny, Deb, and me. He seemed to be trying to decipher the situation. We're having a European dinner, I informed him. I exclaimed that Jen was sitting next to me and Deb was sitting next to Trev. Trevor and my wife quickly exchanged glances and turned away, and Jen burst out laughing. I found that I really liked the atmosphere of our evening in the European style, starting with culinary delights and ending with the seating. Curiosity got the better of Jen. She raised an eyebrow and asked, what else do Europeans usually do? But Trev and Debbie were silent, sitting side by side. It was obvious that they were feeling awkward as Jen continued to engage them in conversation, just being herself. Deep down, I could feel the fun building up inside me. My wife and Trev just looked at us and cast incredulous glances. After serving the food, I offered everyone a glass of wine and didn't give the two sitting across from us a chance to refuse. I just filled their glasses. While we were eating, Jen appreciated the choice of dish and how well it was cooked. Deb and Trevor politely agreed. It was obvious that they were being nice, but they were both uneasy. How was your trip, Trev? I asked while we were eating. He and my wife stopped eating at the same time, and it would have been funny if it hadn't been so depressing. The pain of this realization was getting worse by the minute. Only Jen's hand resting soothingly on my hip brought some comfort. It was not an intimate gesture, but rather a soothing and caring touch. Everything is as usual, he remarked. We meet with clients and representatives in the area, then we move to the next city and repeat the process. Turning to Deb, Jenny asked, Do you have the same situation as Trev? To which she replied, Yes, exactly the same way. We both do a lot of the same work but for different companies and clients. By this time, they were both picking at their food, and again, it was funny if not sad. I tried to ignore it and refilled their glasses. When we were done, that is, we stopped eating because both my wife and Trev had lost their appetites, Jen and I picked up our plates. Debbie offered to help, but I stopped her. You and Trev have just returned from a trip. Go sit in the living room, and we'll be there in a few minutes. Good, with a startled expression and a forced grin, she said. Despite the tension, Trev wanted to talk to his wife, but immediately bowed out and went to the bathroom. Watching them enter the living room, exchanging puzzled glances, I wondered if they were whispering. Although I couldn't distinguish their conversation, my imagination filled in the gaps. Undoubtedly, they were alarmed. When Jen returned, she and I joined their company, grinning. I asked, so it looks like you two aren't intrigued by the idea of an open European marriage. Jen joined me, and her laughter filled the room. But Debbie and Trev seemed more hesitant. They just laughed nervously as if the situation was just a joke. What a pity, Jenny chimed in playfully teasing me. They really need to be liberated. How about we watch something new that I came across this week? I have a feeling you're going to like it. Jen, pretending to be excited, asked, Is this one of those movies about girls? I answered by turning my attention to the TV hanging on the wall and opening the file saved on my hard drive. Actually, it has both male and female elements. In the opening scene, bright street views of the sunlit city and the picturesque coast unfolded before our eyes. The camera then turned to show the naval base, and the car drove north, stopping behind the taxi and in front of the hotel. Trev hesitated for a moment, but Debbie's eyes lit up when she recognized a familiar hotel in the video. We see Trev and Debbie getting out of the taxi and entering the hotel, their faces full of amazement and disbelief as they checked in. The camera dutifully followed their every step, capturing their way to the elevator accompanied by luggage and entwined hands. In anticipation of a tender moment, they bent down for a passionate kiss just as the elevator doors were about to close. But then Trevor intervened, begging me to stop filming. 
But Jen abruptly interrupted him, icily ordering them both to be silent and watch. My attention shifted to my wife, and a mixture of panic and shame was reflected on her face. With trembling lips, she tried to look away from the terrifying scene playing out on the screen. After that, the decorations moved into the interior of the hotel room. It is noteworthy that our main characters have taken center stage. Deb and Trev were naked, with Deb on her knees. Looking at my tearful wife, I couldn't resist commenting, I thought you were planning to betray me along with a bigger size. Trev replied sharply, go to hell, Carson. Eventually, Trev broke the silence, but he didn't say anything. When Jen slapped him and shot him a stern look as the events unfolded, I couldn't help but comment as if I were watching a nature documentary. Hot scenes unfolded before our eyes, and I was shocked. The video sped up, showing their newfound energy before he retired to the bathroom. It was amazing, said Trev. Does he always give you such pleasure? But what did Deb say? From time to time, when her mood changed, my wife replied. I specifically asked you not to mention Carson during the conversation. Confused, he asked, why should I refrain from mentioning him? Remorsefully, he entered the room again and said, my conscience torments me. Disappointed, she replied, I just don't want to discuss it. You're spoiling the atmosphere, Trev. After that, they lay down on the bed, and the video continued to run for almost an hour. They both dozed off, and Deb was the first to wake up. She was lying with her face turned away from Trevor. Soon, he woke up and reached for her. She didn't resist when he gently turned her over onto her stomach. Jen, who had watched the video before, looked at her husband with an icy gaze, which mixed anger with agreement at the undeniable proof of his betrayal. Unable to continue watching, my wife burst into quiet sobs, seeking comfort in my arms. In the subsequent scene, Trevor repeatedly entered into an intimate relationship with my wife. Soon after, they fell into a doze. The video paused for a moment, switching to the next morning when they were back in the same bed and took a shower before splitting up. Both of them were in San Diego. Suddenly, the screen went blank and I stopped playback. Trevor gave me a disappointed look and Jen got up and sat in the seat next to me. Well, she remarked, that was quite revealing, don't you agree? Debbie finally turned her gaze to me. How did you discover this? She asked, the only question with an evil smile. I repeated the entire conversation between Deb and Jen when they were chatting in the kitchen, which took me by surprise. Deb, that's what called into question your loyalty, I said. It made me think about your infidelity. I wasn't sure who was involved, but then I realized it was him. I already had my suspicions. Jen interrupted me, noting how unusually they always cross paths during trips and how sometimes they deliberately avoid each other in conversation. Suddenly, she stopped and looked straight at me. I thought it was funny that they both looked guilty tonight, constantly casting covert glances at each other. Truly, you were both very pitiful. Actually, I hired investigators in all four cities where you went, I said. She wrinkled her nose and shook her head in disbelief. Overwhelmed with emotion, she sobbed again, feeling that there was still a lot of interesting things ahead. In the next video, Deb appeared with another man in a bar, after which they went to a hotel room while making inappropriate physical contact. Once in the room, she began to behave similarly with her companion, performing explicit actions. Trevor, filled with anger, yelled at her, accusing her of treason. My friend Jen and I couldn't help but laugh at Trevor's outburst, noticing the despair on my wife's face. But that's not all, the video continued showing Trevor in a Las Vegas hotel room with a slender and muscular woman. My husband never does this to me, the woman said. Trevor replied, I'm glad I was able to give you this experience, and then retired to the bathroom. From the next room, I couldn't help but show my surprise by clapping my hands. Shaking her head, Debbie expressed disgust. It's just awful, Jen quipped, cheaters deceive each other. It's priceless. There was silence in the room, each of us lost in his own thoughts. Eventually, Debbie broke the silence, and her voice trembled as she addressed me directly. Carson, she began, what have we come to? I turned to face her, my expression serious. You know, I said, addressing both of them, Jen and I took a few days to discuss everything and come to an agreement. We are both open people who are not easily shocked. 
If either of you or both of you had mentioned our conversation, we would have found a common language. To be honest, Dab, I thought about discussing this with you, but you took a different approach, didn't you? You had the opportunity to talk openly and honestly with me so that we could make a decision and move forward together, but you chose to do justice to your own desires and keep me in the dark. Your actions can be regarded as betrayal and deception towards both of us. You've betrayed our trust, Debbie. How can I find the strength to forgive you for this? How do I move on, given the fact that you acted behind my back and believed that you could do whatever you wanted while traveling? Actually, not only when traveling, but how long have you been doing this? Even here, I wouldn't be surprised if this has already happened. As Jen mentioned, I've heard from his colleagues that your beloved wife has repeatedly invited him to lunch. Debbie and Trevor turned away, unable to stand the tension. So Trevor finally asked, what do you want? It looks like we have all the information you need for both of you. Since none of us have children, we are now focusing on the division of property. It is important to note that in Texas, adultery can be used as evidence in a lawsuit, which puts you both in a difficult position. Please hand over your mobile phones for verification. Deb hesitated, but eventually handed me hers without closing it. Trevor stumbled in mid-sentence, but Jen pulled herself together and quickly took his phone. It's not blocked, she said, handing it to me. Please give me a minute to look through them. I got access to his cloud account while she spent a few minutes checking Deb's phone. Unfortunately, Deb didn't keep any evidence, but I couldn't help but stumble across some explicit photos and videos in her gallery featuring Trev and another man. Disappointed, I met her gaze and shook my head. When she looked away, it became clear that after this revelation, trust would never be restored, too many lies, too much wasted time. Just then, Jen's voice rang out, urging us to leave. I turned my head to observe the unfolding situation, but I was faced with a feeling of disbelief. Both of you, the people who work in ethical companies, seem to have forgotten about them. The panic written on your faces was hard to miss. Analyzing the situation, I couldn't help but wonder if you were aware of the consequences your actions may have for your employers and their legal departments. It's frustrating to watch this, especially when you consider that one of you is notorious for pursuing romantic interests in the workplace, but his company had to deal with the consequences of such behavior, which forced him to take a more rigorous approach involving HR and legal services to deal with rule breakers. I couldn't help but wonder if Trevor, who must be your boss, belongs in that category. In a moment of frustration, he muttered a curse under his breath. You know, Trevor, it was your actions that caused all this mess, Jen said angrily. I fulfilled all your desires in bed. I let you treat me like nothing more than a cheap commodity, but you betrayed me, Trevor. Our relationship is officially over. Jen became cold and calculating when she revealed her plan. I took matters into my own hands. Divorce is now inevitable, and both of you will sign the necessary papers granting 70% of our common property. If you dare to challenge this, be prepared for the consequences. We will not hesitate to release a videotape of your incriminating speeches in front of your families and friends. Honestly, Dab, I replied, if everything turned upside down and you found a video of me cheating with Jen, would you still want to sort it out? She begged me to give her another chance but I quickly reminded her of the situation before she went on tour. Despite the consequences we faced, she chose to betray. She decided to start taking the pills without any discussion between us. We decided to live together and build our lives as a team, but you violated my trust and betrayed me even before you had an intimate relationship with him or with anyone else. It seemed that respecting me had become an easy matter for you. I just want to understand why. She looked away for a moment and then met my eyes again. Before you, I didn't have any relationships with other men. You were the only guy who appeared in my life, and it only lasted a minute. That was the extent of my experience before I met you. I stared at her in disbelief. I think you should have thought about it in advance. Usually, people experiment before they tie the knot, not after. Marriage is not just an obligation, it is a legally binding agreement between two people. It means unity and solidarity against all odds. Moreover, marriage implies exclusivity unless both parties, by mutual consent, decide otherwise. Don't forget that it means leaving everyone else behind. She seemed hesitant to speak but eventually expressed her thoughts. Carson, I'd like to go out and have fun before our wedding, but when you showed up, 
I couldn't stand the thought of losing you. Our relationship was great in the early years, but lately, I've been plagued by doubts. I began to think about how it would be with other men, not in the sense of love as it was with you, but simply in the sense of physical intimacy. I sighed in disappointment. Deb, all you had to do was communicate with me. We could explore our desires in the safety and comfort of our own home, with people we both knew and trusted. I would allow you to make contact with this person if it was a collective decision of our group of friends. Unfortunately, you both decided to act without our knowledge and betrayed our trust, Debbie. It's very important to understand that trust and love are accompanied by respect. By acting behind my back, you've lost all respect for me. We had the opportunity to resolve this issue together, but you chose to exclude me. Jen agreed with my feelings. That applies to you too, Trev, especially considering our previous conversation. When Trevor looked away, it was my turn to be surprised by her reaction. Debbie looked at Jen and Trevor in disbelief and then asked, Was that you? Did you really do that? Eager to know what he had said, she continued, What did he tell you? Angered by his response, she blurted out, This despicable man declared that he would never accept Carson's presence and would leave me if I dared to bring up this topic again or got caught. Can you imagine such audacity? Shaking her head in disbelief, Debbie returned to Trevor and forcefully pushed him away, after which she struck a couple of blows. You're an idiot, she growled as he desperately tried to hide from her punches. From the very beginning, I made it clear that we should include them, didn't I? But you assured me that they would never leave us. I listened to your words, but now I doubt our position, Deb. You've turned into a lying person. This change happened quickly, provoking my anger. After our relationship, you started having intimate relationships with others, so please don't pretend to be innocent in my presence. I still vividly remember our first kiss during last year's Christmas. The opportunity arose when Jen left the room for a while and Carson went to the car. I quickly seized the moment, and within a week, we were in each other's arms. Remembering that night, I come back to the memories again and again. Everything looked idyllic, a vacation with my closest friends. But unaware that he and my wife had entered into an intimate exchange of opinions, I despise you, she said sharply to him. The feeling is completely mutual, unhappy woman, he replied. For several agonizing minutes, Jen and I watched their fiery confrontation, gripped by a mixture of contempt and disbelief. Was there any glimmer of hope left after such a revelation? The situation seemed irreparable, burdened with an inordinate amount of deception and betrayal. If we had been parents or a more mature age, perhaps I would have been more vulnerable and thought about the situation. But being young and having no children to cement our relationship, my desire to leave was strong. As if on cue, the doorbell rang again. This time Jen opened it and returned accompanied by a woman with two bags and a smartphone. Turning to my wife, she asked, Deborah Madison Kane, and received a nod of confirmation. In response, you have been served, she said, handing over the envelope and fixing her image on the camera. Turning around, she asked Trevor Anderson. Reluctantly, he nodded, confirming that he had been served. Debbie, now openly sobbing, clutched the papers tightly. Jen, not knowing what to do, shrugged her shoulders and walked over to her husband. With a heavy heart, she declared that their relationship was over. She told him to leave, urging him to pack his things and leave their shared home. She made it clear that she didn't want to see him anymore. In a warning tone, she added that if he dared to say a word to her, the compromising video would be shared with his parents, at work, and with everyone he considered a friend. Realizing the gravity of the situation, Deb remained motionless but eventually turned to face me. Suddenly, she did something that took me by surprise. She got down on her knees and crawled over to Jen and me, with desperation in her voice. She begged us to forgive her and give her another chance, taking full responsibility for her actions. She admitted that she had made a terrible mistake and was willing to endure any consequences as long as we didn't leave her. Tears welled up in her eyes as she begged Jen to intervene in her fate. Looking straight into my eyes, Debbie begged for mercy. At that moment, I realized that this was a real test of my masculine character. Despite feeling deeply betrayed, I couldn't deny that I still loved her. But what she did was incredibly hard to forgive. I hesitated to just kick her out, realizing that it would be unfair, 
but the trust between us was destroyed forever. Jen, I have made the decision that you will move here to my bedroom, I said firmly, meeting her gaze. When I noticed how she flinched, I realized that she was aware of the severity of her act. I understand, she replied, her voice trembling as she held back tears. I deserve it. I'll talk to her about you, okay? As soon as Trevor left the room, closing the door behind him, Jen entered the room again, asking questions about my intentions. What are you planning to do with her? What is it? She asked, expressing concern. You do realize that she can't be trusted, right? I'm sorry, I won't do that, I replied. Debbie's eyes filled with despair as she looked at each of us. Please, she begged softly. But Jen silenced her with a sharp reply, pushing her back to the floor. Debbie froze for a moment and then slowly rose to her knees again. Carson, please change your mind about divorcing me, she begged with desperation in her voice. I looked away, not wanting to comfort her. Debbie, it's too late for that, I said in a cold tone. We are getting divorced, but we will be living separately for three months. You only have this time to prove to me that you deserve to be saved. In the meantime, I'm going to live with Jen, who will occupy the place where your bedroom used to be. Do you understand the situation? Carson, she asked meekly, what do you want me to do? Well, first of all, you have to beg Jen for an opportunity. If she refuses, then it's over for you, Debbie nodded and started to get up from her seat. Get on your knees, Deb, I said. I watched her humble herself in front of Jen, who stood tall with an attractive, slender figure and flowing brown hair. The last two nights with her have been incredibly enjoyable, and I intend to repeat this experience. Jen, I'm really sorry, she pleaded. Jen replied dismissively, Debbie, these are empty words. You're only sorry because you got caught. Despite her explanations, Debbie intervened, I know it might seem that way, Jen, but there are no excuses. You violated my trust as well as your husband's trust. You both deserve each other. If it were up to me, I would personally ask you to leave. But since this is not my place of residence and it will soon cease to be my home, I suggest finding an inexpensive motel for today or for the weekend, and then start looking for an apartment to move into. It's important that you have time to think about your actions. Debbie turned to me, hoping for salvation, but I just remained motionless in my gaze, not moving an inch. Pack your things and leave, Debbie, I ordered her. Get your stuff ready for at least a week, and we can discuss how to get the rest of the stuff if necessary. When she nodded and sobbed again, an expression of despair and submissive agreement appeared on her face. With gradual movements, she got up and went to the bedroom to pack her things. After 40 minutes, she managed to pack two suitcases, a travel bag, a laptop bag, and a purse. Jen and I watched her load everything into the car and stood together when she stopped at the last moment. Although she held out her hand to me, I instinctively pulled away. Jen and I stood and watched my future ex-wife leave, tears streaming down her face. She was sobbing uncontrollably, and it was a heartbreaking sight. It went better than we thought, Jen whispered, leaning towards me. I nodded in agreement, knowing deep down that my ex-wife had brought this fate upon herself. As we watched her car disappear into the distance, a thought occurred to me, every spouse has the opportunity to change, but not everyone decides to do it, I said, reflecting on the choices people make in a relationship. Jen looked at me, a hint of amusement in her eyes. It's funny, she said as we started walking back together. I raised an eyebrow, curious as to what she found funny in such a situation. When we got to our destination, Jen started to undress, and her words froze in the air. Some people think they have an open marriage, she scoffed, shaking her head in disbelief, interrupting the moment. I hesitated and asked the question, are you offering a free relationship? After a short pause, I expressed my doubts, saying, interacting with other people seems too much like a date to me. Wanting to clarify the situation, I asked, do you really want this? In response, she said that she longs for change and diversity, admitting that she has not experienced anything else for a long time. Reflecting on their words, I found myself thinking about the possibility of finding connections with other companions. Maybe I also need to communicate with another woman sometimes, I finally formulated. Agreed, she gasped in a strained voice. And so, three months later, the divorce was finalized. 
Surprisingly, both Jen and I received the 70% we requested. Jen decided to sell her house, and I resorted to a loan to compensate Debbie for her 30% share. It was a quick day in court where all our financial and legal issues were settled. But despite the resolution of the situation, Debbie could not get rid of the nagging pain and guilt. She lost everything except her job. Eventually, her parents found out the truth when she began to prepare them for the fact that I could share with them videos and photos taken in a fit of vindictiveness. Trevor just disappeared after his divorce from Jen. Despite the fact that she managed to buy him out, he said goodbye, saying that he would keep in touch with her. Two years have passed since then, and there is no trace of him left. Debbie, on the other hand, continues to work and travel, and her actions no longer bother me. Recently, when Jen and I were in a cafe, she hurried past, engrossed in her phone. Although Jen and I live in the same apartment, we both still hesitate to enter into a serious relationship. It's been a year since my divorce. I'm increasingly faced with the fact that I can't remember the memories I shared with Debbie. Jen and I often start talking about our aspirations to explore different corners of the globe. At least that's what we discussed. Unfortunately, our grandiose plans were suddenly disrupted by an unrelenting virus that came from Wuhan, China. As a result, our vacation turned into a monotonous routine consisting of running, walking, and passionate intimate moments. But despite all these distractions, the fear doesn't subside in me, and Jen feels the same way. This is quite natural given the tumultuous experience we have had recently. An unexpected letter came from Debbie. The message began, Hello, Carson. I hope you're in good health. Trying to accept a new beginning turned out to be quite difficult. The absence of our common moments weighs heavily on my heart. I miss your presence and the bond we once shared. During a time of reflection, I realize the extent of the damage that I have done to you, to myself, and to our relationship. Unfortunately, I made the grave mistake of believing that I deserve everything I want, regardless of the consequences. My pursuit of intimate exploration and personal satisfaction led me to harm a person who was deeply dear to me, which led to the dissolution of our marriage. I also played a role in the breakup of Jenny and Trevor's union. Although it may be tempting to place the blame for the sad events that have occurred solely on him, I recognize my own role in this situation. But we are well aware that this statement is far from the truth. Without any external influence, I voluntarily committed all the actions that I committed. It is with great regret that I owe you an apology, Carson. Not only have I ruined our marriage and the life we built together, but as you rightly pointed out, I've lost all respect for you. But before I got to that point, I first lost respect for myself. I foolishly accepted the idea that I deserved temporary pleasure, not paying attention to the huge losses that I would suffer as a result. Now I find myself burdened with an unexpected experience that I never expected, divorce, a topic that cannot be called trivial in any way. There is absolutely nothing attractive or pleasant about this situation. She totally broke me up. I've heard that you and Jen are still in a relationship, and although I sincerely wish you both happiness, I can't deny that I'm jealous. Please take care of yourself. Love, your unhappy ex-wife, Debbie. I also want to say that life has punished me because I am lonely and infertile. I cannot have children, and this is the price I pay for the pain I caused. Story 2 I was told that I was born in a privileged position, as if I had a silver spoon in my mouth. But what does it really mean? Does this mean that I am one of the lucky few? If that means wealth, then I have to admit my guilt. But don't rush to admire or condemn me without listening to the end. I can say with confidence that although I personally did not deserve what I have, I paid the price for it. I continue to bear the consequences of my parents' actions. I will not deceive you, my parents are not solely responsible for shaping who I am today, but it also does not relieve them of responsibility. My grandfather worked tirelessly, exhausting himself and sweating to make his fortune in the traditional way. If the sweat was his own, he would undoubtedly deserve respect. But his wealth was accumulated through the exploitation of impoverished and vulnerable workers. He shamefully paid them only a fraction of their true value while burdening them with double compensation. This brings me to my father, who was forced to serve meekly under the despotic rule of my tyrannical grandfather. Instead of treating him like a son, he was treated like a mere employee. 
despite his hard and long-term work, he faced a new era that defended workers' rights through trade unions and employee protection. And yet, his unwavering dedication and exceptional abilities ultimately helped him succeed in the business field. Having acquired the necessary business skills in the corporation, the company flourished under his leadership. As for me, I gave up caring about my grandfather's business and trusting the management of it to capable people on my behalf. A team of qualified and experienced managers is working hard to ensure that my financial achievements continue to grow. Admittedly, the company is thriving despite my insignificant contribution. Perhaps you perceive me as a privileged, well-off person despite my early 30s. Although your judgment makes some sense, your opinion ultimately has no influence or meaning for me. Other people's expectations no longer affect me, as I have become indifferent to them. It is important to note that this indifference is not the result of my fortunate circumstances, but rather the result of the actions of those who were closest to me in life. In particular, my father, mother, and then my wife contributed to this. My journey began 38 years ago when I was born on a cool winter day. My father, Robert Jr., named me Robert III in honor of my grandfather, Robert Sr., who died before I was born. After my grandfather's death, the responsibility for his business and wealth fell on my father's shoulders. Determined to maintain his reputation as a successful businessman, my father devoted himself to work. He got married later in life, at the age of 44, to my mother, who was only 20 years old. The main motive of their union was the desire to get an heir who could continue the family name. That heir was me. But in my father's busy life, there was no place for me except a simple title. He worked long hours, leaving me with only fleeting memories of his presence. Remembering his childhood, a person usually brings to mind numerous images of his father. But for me, these images are scarce. I have no recollection of him enjoying the beach or participating in a pleasant picnic, and I don't remember him attending my graduation. It was only many years after his death that I learned the truth about his life, filled with numerous mistresses. My mother apparently was just a means for him to have a child, someone who could carry on his name. Although she undoubtedly loved him, he never returned her love. As soon as I was born, her romantic dreams were shattered. Despite all her attempts to convince Robert Jr. to become a real husband, she eventually sought solace in alcohol and depressants. As a result, I was raised mainly by a nanny. I was considered only as a means of satisfying physical needs and not cherished as a beloved family member. Over time, I reached the age when I was sent to the most prestigious boarding schools that money could afford. But my stay in these institutions was short-lived, as I was in danger of being expelled from these respected institutions. It was at the military college that I finally began to realize my identity. I found myself in the position of an outcast, unwanted by both my family and everyone else except the school, which sought to benefit from my presence. They received generous compensation for keeping me within their walls. I was subjected to strict discipline, trying to mold me into a likeness. I was denied the freedom to leave the school, and I found myself trapped within its walls. I refused to pretend to be a kid who's been expelled from countless East Coast schools. The threat of losing the biggest patron, my father, hung over every educational institution. Reality was opening up to me in its raw form. My value as a person was measured not by human connections, but solely by those who could use our relationship for financial gain. The news of my parents' death reached me when I was a student. At that moment, the details were hidden from me, but over time, the horrifying truth was revealed. Both my parents died on the same day by a strange coincidence. My father's untimely death was attributed to heart failure, and my mother's tragic end was attributed to a car accident. But it wasn't until years later that I discovered an unusual connection between these seemingly unrelated events. Unbeknownst to me, a minuscule 9mm silently triggered my father's fatal cardiac arrest, which coincidentally occurred while my mother was in the same room. Surprisingly, further revelations revealed that one of my father's many mistresses also passed away prematurely in the same bed. As the veil of mystery enveloped my mother's death, there was a sense of intrigue and unanswered questions in the air. When her car crashed into a power pole, experts assumed she had exceeded the speed limit by 130 miles per hour. The circumstances strongly hinted that her blood alcohol level was alarmingly high. After receiving the devastating news of my parents' death, 
one would have expected my world to shatter into countless pieces. But to tell the truth, the feelings were almost the same as when I heard about the death of two strangers. The thoughtful reaction of my father's company was aimed at presenting these incidents as two completely separate tragic accidents. At that moment, no one questioned this version, and even now, I consider it inappropriate to dwell on the details of their lives or untimely demise. Have you ever wondered how a person can experience such a lack of empathy? Personally, I don't consider myself heartless, just rather indifferent. Would you shed tears over the death of a stranger who died thousands of miles away? I doubt it very much. Of course, the death of a child caused by someone's actions may cause some sadness for both you and me, but the death of a cheated spouse or a reckless drunk driver hardly hits our emotional radar. When I was only 20 years old, life threw me into the field of high finance. It was during my studies at the military college that I received two invaluable lessons, loyalty and devotion should be rewarded according to their merits, and incompetence and disloyalty should entail serious consequences. These invaluable lessons have played an important role in determining my path. The top management of my father's company, which I now head, was inept and indecisive. It was necessary to carry out transformations, and I took responsibility for them. Throughout my life, I have trusted one person, a military man. He was unwaveringly loyal and never hesitated to tell the truth, even when it was hard to hear. He served as a math teacher at the academy, and John Miller became the closest thing to a father I've ever known. I had to beg John to convince him to join my team. He was not interested in the corporate world or the people who held high positions in it. John firmly believed that it would be difficult for him because he did not understand the business field. But when I reminded him that a general does not need to be able to shoot a rifle, but rather send an experienced soldier to the right place, he reluctantly agreed. Surprisingly, within six months he managed to manage everything without exception, like a well-established mechanism. John has achieved amazing success and led the business to prosperity. Although my presence was no longer necessary, I decided to continue working with him. Every day, I longed to find a goal that would get me out of bed. Despite my limited skills and natural abilities, I managed to delve into the intricacies of my company's work. Although it seemed unnecessary, I can't remember a single time when I had to make a decision in the presence of a subordinate. Having lost both my parents in my first year of work, I found myself completely alone, faced with a completely unfamiliar existence. I had no babysitter to rely on, no school to structure my days, and no clear path to follow. Left to my own devices, I succumbed to a deep sense of hopelessness. Alcohol became my comfort, as it was for my mother. I drank to hold on to the memories, and I drank to escape from them. Jack became my only confidant. While others were looking for my friendship as a commodity, Whiskey Jack was the only one who didn't expect anything in return. But when it came to women, the narrative took a different turn. They rushed at me, and I willingly accepted their friendly participation. But in my eyes, these women were just objects of desire. They had their ulterior motives, while I pursued my own. For them, I was just a financial resource, and for me, they were nothing more than a one-time thing. Only rarely has a woman attracted my attention for more than one fleeting night. When I gained the notoriety of being a rich and attractive bachelor in the city, it amused me to watch a swarm of mercantile people. When I crossed the threshold of a bar or restaurant, the flirting process started with a simple glance and quickly turned into aggressive harassment. The intriguing thing was that I never had to take the first step, women were more willing to take the initiative. I was never exceptional at school, just an average student. But thanks to my dedication to studying at the university, I received a master's degree with honors. I devoted myself wholeheartedly to my studies, demonstrating unwavering diligence. In my twenties, countless women tried to persuade me to marry, but I never felt ready to make such a commitment. The idea of leading a married life just didn't appeal to me. The women begged me and even promised not to pay attention to any wrongdoing, all in the hope of becoming my wife. It amazed me that someone could do such a thing out of love, and I believed that the real motive for them was money. But everything changed after my 31st birthday, when I met a woman who changed my idea of marriage. Even though she wasn't the brightest woman I've ever met, she had a profound effect on me. I felt an inexplicable attraction to her, an indeterminate magnetism that captivated me. It was her undeniable presence that caught my attention. 
Surprisingly, we did not cross paths in our usual meeting places, but in a cozy little diner. This meeting marked the first time I had to summon the courage and take the initiative. While she was peacefully enjoying lunch at a table by the window, I felt an irresistible urge to approach her. Fortunately, she kindly invited me to join her, as all the other tables were occupied. While we were enjoying our meal, we had a light conversation. I didn't know that Chris actually worked for me, and this fact escaped my attention. I had almost no free time during my visit there, and even less time to chat with the people who worked for me. But there was one person who seemed to recognize me immediately, Chris. Without requiring any confirmation from her, I felt that she had a rather low opinion of me. When we finished our lunch with a casual conversation, she politely left to return to her business. Despite all my efforts, I couldn't get rid of her presence in my thoughts. There was something captivating about Chris, a woman who was not driven by wealth or material values. Judging by the scant information I had gathered, she was smart and independent. This piqued my curiosity, and I committed myself to learning more about her. I had an inexplicable desire to see her again, to sort out the mystery that was Christine. For a whole week, I went to the cafe every day, hoping to see her, but she wasn't there. Deciding to find out more, I decided to ask about her whereabouts at work. After some investigation, I finally found out which department she works in. Taking advantage of the opportunity, I went to her desk the next day just before noon. Having plucked up the courage, I asked her if she would like to join me for lunch, but Chris politely declined my invitation. She explained that she just couldn't find the time that day. Disappointed, I left silently, feeling a little defeated. But then an idea struck me. A few minutes later, I returned to her table holding a bag of sandwiches from the cafe. It looks like you don't take no for an answer, she said, shaking her head and smiling faintly. Her words did not discourage me, instead, I answered confidently, that's what makes me attractive, so I'm told. You have limited qualities beyond the bedroom. Well, every man should have his own occupation. Let me clarify, I am not someone's leisure. I sincerely apologize for that remark. It seems like I'm not particularly good at humor either. Could you give me the opportunity to correct my mistake? I doubt very much that this is advisable. Please, just dinner. I'm not asking for anything else. You refuse to take no for an answer, don't you? We agreed to have dinner next Friday. I wish I could say that we fell in love with each other and lived happily ever after, but after a few months of dating, we discovered that we had little in common. In Chris, I found a person with whom I could have sincere and honest conversations. It was very nice to find such an open and honest person. In addition, my drinking habit decreased significantly from a few bottles a week to several glasses. Our walks together began to resemble psychoanalysis sessions rather than romantic dates. We delved into the discussion of her life aspirations and the depth of my personal problems. Chris wanted a normal life, a successful career, love, marriage, and children. We often sat by my pool under the dark night sky and looked at the stars, having deep conversations. It became obvious to both of us that a romantic relationship between us was unlikely to flourish. This realization especially struck us one surprisingly clear night during peaceful stargazing. Chris struck me with a rather unexpected question. Rob, is it true what the girls are saying about you? I hesitated, not understanding exactly what she meant. Well, it depends on what they say, I suppose, I replied cautiously. Deciding to get an answer, Chris continued, are you really that good in bed? I felt a wave of discomfort wash over me. Chris, I honestly don't know how to answer this. How can I assess someone's abilities in this regard? I guess you'll have to take their word for it, I responded perplexed. But why is it so important how experienced I am? I asked. Chris, eager to share her own revelations, said, Well, I talked to a few girls at work, and they all agreed that no one will surpass you in this matter. So I thought maybe you could teach me. Stunned by her request, I couldn't help but reply incredulously, You must be joking, Chris. No, really. Are you kidding me? Chris, meanwhile, was completely serious. I've only had a relationship with one person, and he was quite young. Therefore, for the next experience, I want to be with a mature and reliable man who knows how to make me feel valuable. 
To be honest, Chris, it doesn't fit your character. In fact, my sister refrained from intimate relations until the wedding night, but she was deeply disappointed after waiting so long. She dreamed of finding her prince charming, and now she regrets that she got married. During our conversation last week, she confessed to me that she was having an affair, and her husband intends to file for divorce. This situation made me think about my own future. I am determined not to find myself in the same predicament as her. Chris, I am deeply attached to you. It's like loving a sister, I suppose. Is it considered normal for someone to have such feelings for a brother or sister? We both realized the absurdity of my statement and burst out laughing. Well, Rob, it looks like your sense of humor is improving, but seriously speaking, are you suggesting that we might have a romantic relationship? Chris asked. If you are absolutely sure of your feelings, Chris, I am ready to do almost anything for you. But I want to avoid further complications in our already difficult relationship. You have to understand that from the very beginning, I did not expect that after the first dates, we would become close. I sincerely value the time we spend together. You're the only one who doesn't have any hopes for me, especially when it comes to our relationship. Rob, I sincerely want it too. As you said before, you don't expect any intimate actions from me, and that's why I believe in you. We will spend time together with full transparency and without any obligations. I am confident enough in my understanding of you to know that I will not become just another conquest. I will also not take on any emotional obligations on your part, okay? Chris proposed. Okay, Chris. Please get the bag ready. We'll leave on Friday after work. But why? And where are we going, Rob? I didn't expect it. Chris, I want this to be a special experience for you. Please pack your things for the whole weekend. We'll leave on Friday afternoon. Chris felt an overwhelming anxiety when we boarded the plane to Lake Tahoe, but I'd put a lot of effort into organizing a charming chalet with spectacular views, perfect for a real romantic getaway. After settling in the room, we had a candlelit dinner by the warm fireplace, adding several glasses of chilled wine to create an intimate atmosphere. My actions caused Chris to make gentle and affectionate sounds, which only spurred my desire to make her feel desired. Now, as Chris lay relaxed and caught her breath, I moved closer and hugged her tightly. I silently let her drift off to sleep, finding solace in my arms. It was a tiring day for both of us, but sleep didn't come to me for a while. I watched Chris with awe, enjoying the presence of this extraordinary woman next to me. When dawn broke, I found Chris sleeping peacefully beside me. I made a cup of coffee and returned with two mugs in my hands. Did you have a good rest, my love? I asked softly. Oh, I wish I could sleep like this every night, she replied, yawning and smiling. Handing her a warm mug, I went back to bed, enjoying our closeness. I couldn't help but smile at the thought of spending every day with Chris, but I kept that feeling to myself. Deep down, I knew that her aspirations and dreams did not coincide with the future in which I was. It was extremely important not to betray to her my newfound hope for something more. What kind of stupid smile is that, Rob? What is it? She asked, catching me off guard. I'm just enjoying my coffee, I quickly lied, hiding my true emotions. And yet, behind closed doors, our intimacy grew. We took a shower together, and every moment, I dreamed of a future with Chris. But I fell in love with a woman who would inevitably reject me. Although we had a physical connection, Chris just used me as a stepping stone to learn how to love another. All my life, I have distanced myself from people who sought to use me for their own selfish purposes. It could be argued that Chris was just making fun of me for personal gain, but I saw this as an opportunity for her to reciprocate my love for her. It was a small chance to reach her heart. During the day, we strolled along the shore of the lake, enjoying each other's company, holding hands, having light conversations, and just enjoying the time spent together. In the evening, we shared an intimate moment unlike any I've experienced before. Even if I never meet Chris again, this day with her will always remain in my memory until my last breath. The next day, we returned home, but I couldn't shake off the feeling of sadness coming from Chris. Intrigued, I plucked up the courage and asked about it, but she skillfully avoided the topic by entering into a conversation and not giving a direct answer. When I dropped her off at the door, she suddenly kissed me on the lips and hurried to her apartment. 
As she got out of my car, a single tear glistened in her eyes. Desperate to understand her sudden change, I tried to contact her later, but my calls went unanswered. I didn't know that this would mark the end of our relationship. For several years, Chris disappeared without a trace, leaving me unable to contact her. I must admit I missed her presence a lot. She became the only woman who truly entered my life and had an undeniable influence on it. But we agreed that our time together would not be associated with any emotional attachments. She doesn't owe me anything, and I had to accept it. I made a conscious decision to distance myself from her and learn to live without her presence. I wasn't interested in other women, so I decided to go on a trip and travel a bit to clear my mind. Without having a specific destination in mind, I let my mood guide my travels. Over the next three months, I explored different parts of the world and then returned home. During this time, I managed to let go of my feelings for Chris as much as possible. I no longer hoped for a future with her. I was proud to leave Whiskey Jack, a symbol of our past, untouched on the shelf. I went on dates with other women, but none of them could match the beauty I saw in the crystal. There were no women wilder than Chris, or so I thought. I resigned myself to the idea that I would live the rest of my life as a bachelor until fate intervened once again. It was an ordinary evening. I was driving home from work, waiting patiently behind the car at the red traffic light, ready to continue on my way as soon as the green light turned on. But then, as if out of nowhere, a sudden movement to my right caught my attention. I reacted quickly and braked, but it was too late to avoid a collision with a woman running across the road in front of me. In a panic, I immediately called an ambulance and the police and then jumped out of the car to help the injured woman. To my surprise, she was conscious and apologizing, expressing her remorse for what had happened. I tried to calm her down and advised her not to worry, assuring her that everything would be fine. Feeling her emotional distress, I volunteered to contact her family on her behalf. In response, she asked me to contact her mother. Without hesitation, I dialed the number and assured her that. I would inform her mother as soon as the paramedics arrived. It was a really unconventional way to start a relationship. From the very beginning, I offered my help to both her and her mother, providing support in any capacity they needed. Realizing that her mother had no transportation, I willingly accompanied her on shopping trips, trying not to interfere. In addition, I took it upon myself to take her to medical appointments and rehabilitation classes. Despite the fact that the authorities recognized the incident as accidental, I could not help but feel a sense of responsibility. And approached me in a different way than other women usually do, and it reminded me of Chris. After a long period of recovery, Anne's cast was finally removed. To mark the occasion, I invited her and her mother to join me for a celebratory dinner. I couldn't help but notice how important her mother was in Anne's development. The three of us went to dinner together trying to dance from time to time. Although it seemed a little uncomfortable for Anne, I even had the opportunity to share a dance with her mother. When I drove them home, they both expressed their appreciation with kisses, thanking me for the support I had given them over the past few months. There was something about Anne's kiss that made me crave more. Therefore, we began to spend more time together, gradually establishing a more stable connection. If I try to briefly describe Anne, my initial idea of her as an introvert was refuted after our first intimate meeting. As a result, we got married, although not only for love on my part. Can you remember the moment when you did a stupid thing and when you were asked about your motives you replied that at that moment it seemed to you that this was the right thing to do? That's why I married Anne. Over the years, Anne has established herself as an exemplary wife. She was a skilled cook and housekeeper. Although I offered to hire assistants and preferred to avoid strangers in our house. In fact, I was quite happy with this state of affairs. Having been confronted with wealth all my life, I have become quite immune to its appeal. I wanted a more modest existence, which led me to the decision to sell the grand mansion built by my grandfather many years ago. It is at this moment that I learned about the betrayal of my wife, who gave her heart to another man. That's where the plot turns. It turns out that he couldn't satisfy her as a partner. His world is falling apart, and he can't go on without the love of his life. The wife's love for her husband is undeniable, but she dreams of a 26 in matching the size and color of the tires on your car. Unfortunately, my dear friends, the fulfillment of this wish is out of the question. 
But this story is not related to this particular desire. Instead, she plunges into the depths of greed, the power that turns people into greedy predators. I found out about Anne's betrayal in the most common way that unfaithful wives are exposed, by negligence. I was bored at work on a weekday. Remember, I am a person who prefers to avoid work. I found myself in the office and wondered what Anne was doing. It's amazing how many possibilities a computer gives, isn't it? Without much effort, I was able to connect to my home network with a few mouse clicks. Thanks to the integration of home video surveillance, I could easily observe various rooms. And then I noticed in the kitchen, leisurely enjoying a glass of iced tea with two slices of lemon. The quality of the camera allowed me to capture these details. But what caught my attention was that she wasn't alone. After making a few extra clicks, I brought up my lawyer, Bill Larson, on the screen. To say that I despised him would be an understatement. In my eyes, he was a truly despicable person. He was renowned as the most skillful lawyer money could afford, and when I say afford, I mean that Bill was ready to sink to any level for the sake of a dollar. I accidentally turned on the air just as he was preparing to leave, ending a conversation with someone unknown. Although I couldn't decipher their conversation, it seemed to be coming to an end. Switching the camera, I watched as she escorted him to the exit. When they reached the door, Bill suddenly grabbed Anne and pulled her towards him. Bending down, he pressed a kiss to her lips, but Anne's expression showed her obvious displeasure, and she began to resist his attraction. Gathering her strength, she managed to push him away and even slapped him in the face with a swift slap. I heard her decisive words, You despicable scoundrel. No amount of money will tempt me to be with you. I am determined to get to the truth and figure out the situation. It's clear that I'm not a genius when it comes to these issues. So what do I do when I need help? I hire the most competent people to protect my interests. John was the one who managed to get the best help, and he succeeded in a surprisingly short time. They arrived at my office. Bullard subtly dealt with their questions. Standing in front of me were Jeff and Paul, two experienced people. They spent 30 minutes gathering all the necessary information to explore all aspects of my life, starting from the first day. With the information I have and the surveillance system, I could find what I need myself. An independent investigation would also take some time. Yes, I had free time, but if I work in anger, mistakes will be made. I felt that seeing what I suspected was happening would make me lose my temper. This would be difficult for two reasons. First of all, I shouldn't have doubted what was going on before reacting. I needed to know the whole story at once in order to make the right decisions. And the second most important thing is how could I keep my composure around and, even though I was angry about what I already knew, I needed to avoid arousing any suspicion. It turned out that Ann and Bill's plan did not go as I expected. The Bullets managed to expose the entire scheme in just five days. This made me reconsider my initial reaction to the alleged affair, simply divorcing and firing Bill would not be enough. As punishment for their cooperation, their intentions went beyond that. They plotted to take my life. At first, and didn't seem to know that Bill was going to eliminate me. She explained to him that she couldn't find any good reason to divorce me, although the prenuptial agreement would provide her with sufficient financial support. It would still be less than what she could have had if she had stayed with me. Despite mentioning that I wasn't a perfect husband, she couldn't find a reason to end our relationship. As he outlined his plan to harm me and realized my considerable wealth, Avarice began to awaken in Anne. But she did not dare to take part in such an illegal and immoral act. In the end, the temptation of money took over. She imagined herself as a grieving widow who inherited a huge fortune that would last a lifetime. Bill found himself in a difficult financial situation due to unsuccessful investments. Desperately looking for a way out, he viewed me as a golden ticket to wealth. Little did he know that every moment was captured on my security system's hard drive. As they sat casually at my table, calmly strategizing as if it were just an unexpected celebration for me, I couldn't help but mock their audacity. From the evidence gathered by the bullets, it was clear that convicting them would be a piece of cake. They could face life in prison for conspiracy to commit a crime, and I was leaning towards that option. For Bill, the thought of him spending the rest of his life among criminals intrigued me. I learned about their immediate plans from a detailed report provided by the Bullets. 
I tried to keep my composure when I was in his presence, and I was constantly on my guard. She turned out to be the same affectionate and that I had always known, skillfully playing her role. By the end of the week, my revenge plan should have been put into action. At noon on Friday, I dialed their house number, and and answered the phone. Hi, and I said. Hello, baby, how is my beloved doing today? She replied. Well, I'm a little tired, but I'm fine. What's going on? Can you come to the office immediately? I have a pleasant surprise for you. Of course, my dear. I'll be there in 20 minutes because you know how much I love your surprises. Great. I'll be waiting for you. Soon after finishing the conversation, I headed to John's office. John, she's on her way. Have you made all the necessary preparations? Yes, Rob, it's all set. You have approximately 48 hours to ensure a safe departure from the country. What about Bill? The authorities will detain him when he leaves the church this Sunday. Great. But are the Bullets making progress on another assignment? They are certainly working hard on it. I hurried back to my office, still puzzled by how impassive she looked. It's incredible how she could act as if nothing had happened. If I were her, I wouldn't be able to look her in the eye, let alone keep such a calm face. Despite her lack of emotion, I have to admit that she ranks first on the list of the most indifferent and self-centered people I've ever come across. Everything, no doubt, revolved around her. So, Rob, what's the big surprise? She asked as she entered the room and tried to hide her true feelings. Well, hello to you too, and I replied with a note of surprise in my voice. Oh, my apologies, baby. You know how much I love surprises. Yes, I'm sure I'll be thrilled, I replied, sarcasm in my tone. Please don't keep me waiting any longer. What is it? Okay, he began, preparing to reveal the surprise. Join me, and I'll tell you how we get to the airport. Wait, I haven't packed my things yet. Where exactly are we going? What should I wear? Don't worry, I've taken care of everything. If it were up to me, clothes wouldn't be needed at all. Where are we going? The charming city of Paris. I only revealed a small part of the surprise to you. I have been carefully preparing for a journey that none of us will forget. The night before I left, I diligently packed our things while and seemed to be fascinated by all the charms of Paris. I personally found them somewhat excessive. Our days were devoted mainly to exploring the sights of the city, our evenings were filled with delicious dinners and exciting theatrical performances. But among our indulgences, I managed to slip away from in one fateful morning to call John. I was eager to learn about the consequences of Bill's arrest. John informed me that the whole town was talking about it. Bill ended up behind bars, and his wife categorically refused to bail him out. He was crying pitifully, showing his weak nature. Meanwhile, the warrant for Anne's arrest was patiently awaiting execution. The police were far from delighted with my audacious act of taking her out of the country. In the end, after an amazing week spent in Paris, we embarked on a great cruise ship trip to Scandinavia, enjoying the exquisite cuisine and vibrant nightlife of the ship. We plunged into a state of relaxation. One afternoon, I watched in gracefully gliding through the crystal clear waters of the pool while I sat on a chaise lounge. A longing for a different outcome settled in me. Despite her undoubted devotion as a wife, there was a dark side to her desires that wished me harm. Perhaps I should have loved her with all my heart and not just accepted her presence as a matter of convenience. Unfortunately, I have to admit that this predicament is most likely my own fault. It is not easy for any woman to endure such a relationship as ours, although many others before and claimed that they succeeded. But I remain skeptical about their ability to find true happiness in such circumstances. If only Chris would give me a chance, even a small opportunity to change the course of my life. The cruise sailed gracefully along the Scottish coast, sending us on an unforgettable journey. And didn't know that the next stop, a quaint Icelandic port, would mark the end of our adventure together. We rented a car and went to a secluded resort located 30 miles inland, wherein curiously questioned me about my motives for leaving the comfortable ship. It was unknown that this place was far from her ideal vacation spot, as she despised the biting cold and was undoubtedly a city dweller. Trying to justify my decision, 
I told her that I had already been to this place and wanted to enjoy its beauty for the last time before we continued our voyage. In the evening, we decided to have an early dinner at the hotel's only restaurant. When we were shown our room, I decided to go to bed early, expressing to and my desire to meet the dawn the next day. I couldn't sleep that night, knowing full well what was waiting for me in the morning. At dawn, I carefully packed my bag, making sure that it included our passports and all of Anne's documents. After leaving her clothes and enough money to feed her for several months, I gently woke up my future ex-wife. Whispering, and it's time to wake up. I need to say goodbye to you. There was confusion in her eyes when I said those words. Saying goodbye to her, I'm leaving you and coming home, I said, devoid of any emotion. You can't be serious, she exclaimed, disbelief in her voice. You can't leave me here. There was a hint of desperation in her words. Have you completely lost your mind? I shook my head calmly. No, I don't think so. Moreover, I think I have become wiser. Her voice trembled with resentment when she questioned my motives. But why did you do this to me? And why do you think that I will stay, even if you leave? I couldn't help but smile at her question. It's simple, my dear wife. I don't agree with the plan you came up with, Bill. You see... I'm not quite ready to face death yet. It's incredibly hard for me to forgive you for what you've done. In addition, if you try to leave the country, you must have a passport. It should be noted that an arrest warrant awaits you at home. In addition, a federal warrant has been issued against you for criminal prosecution. If you try to get a new passport, you will be extradited back to face charges. I'm begging you, there has to be another solution, tears welled up in Anne's eyes as she pleaded. Unfortunately, this is not possible. But before I leave, let me share with you a funny thought. If you had asked for a divorce, you would still have received your share of the money. I have always believed that money has no special value for me. The idea of acquiring wealth was never my goal. Rather, it was J.N. who insisted on its implementation. As I sat on the plane returning home, a feeling of sadness gripped my heart. Part of me wished now that Anne's plans had worked out. It looks like I was destined to die. At least and would have found joy in the wealth I now possess. Returning to the house was filled with conflicting emotions. I was still alive, but for what? There was nothing to expect from my arrival and certainly no one to greet me. How cruelly ironic my life has turned out. The age-old saying that money can't buy happiness was probably written especially for me. I wasted no time and started the divorce process. It turned out to be a simple matter since it was only a matter of time before the divorce was officially announced. John brought the only positive news I've received lately. Bullard has once again proved their reliability. I mentally thanked them and attached to the letter a generous payment for their services. Chris, on the other hand, moved to a small town on the west coast of Northern California. Her life as a widow with a young daughter took a different turn. Even though I didn't know what to say to her after all this time, I felt obligated to reach out and try. I felt a glimmer of hope, no matter how small it was. And I realized that I had to take advantage of it. Time was incredibly generous to Chris. She looked more stunning than I could remember. In my eyes, she has become the epitome of attractiveness. It seems that the feeling was mutual because when she saw me, she radiated sincere happiness. We told each other about our lives but underneath our conversation, there was an unspoken tension, and neither of us dared to cross this invisible barrier. Deciding to break the silence, I plucked up the courage and spoke first. Chris, why did you run away from me? I asked, unable to contain my curiosity any longer. She hesitated for a moment, and her answer sounded a little complicated. It's difficult, Rob. I'm not sure I can discuss it, she replied, her voice full of uncertainty. I begged, and there was desperation in my words. Please, Chris, I need to know. But she shook her head, her resolve unyielding. I can't, Rob. It's too hard to bear. Have I harmed you? I never meant to hurt you. Let me fix the situation. Oh my god, no, Rob. It wasn't you, it was me. You were amazing. I don't understand, Chris. You didn't do anything wrong. I was afraid to get too close, to rush things. No, Rob, please.
please. I can't discuss this. Chris, I need to understand what happened. Please, just tell me. You still refuse to take no for an answer, don't you? No, and I'm not leaving until we resolve this issue. I love you, Chris. I want to understand why. What? Rob, please reconsider this decision. Chris, you are very dear to me. My love for you has lasted all these years. Oh my God, Rob, you don't need someone like me. That's why I decided to run away. It's not because of your love for me, but because I'm not who you think I am. The fact that you love me only makes the situation worse. I'm just like all the other loose women, and now I feel like the worst of them. Chris was in tears now. Chris, it doesn't matter to me, I soothed. But Rob replied, No, now that you've told me about yourself, I'll never be able to look at you without feeling like I betrayed you. It matters to me, and our relationship will never be successful. This time you'll have to accept my refusal. I took two steps forward, taking one last look back at my beloved Chris. One day, I came across the idea that every man has his own ideal mate. Although there is some truth in this idea, I can't help feeling that I found and then lost this extraordinary woman. Despite my determination to continue searching for a life partner, my heart tells me that my efforts will be in vain. If you think that money is the key to solving all your problems, my friend, think again. Although the money I possess may be linked to every heartache I have experienced, it has never been the root cause. Ultimately, people are at the root of our troubles. Can we completely exclude them from our lives? Of course not. It is very important to be careful when choosing people who touch our soul. Love and friendship cannot be bought in a store, they must be earned through trial and error.